gather today, today tonight like this we bless thee for sparing us another day none of us can be presumptuous to know we have another day so many lord i can think of in our mission young younger than these dear people that in a moment we're just gone accidents oh lord we just thank you that you gave us another day in life a privileged day to serve you and even that we can come together and uh, gather for the glory of Christ and out of love for Christ be united outside of which we probably wouldn't be together ever in life or choose each other but we are so grateful because of Jesus we are one and so come our God in thy mercy wash me in the blood of Christ and protect us all and come visit us and let this be a precious time a time of nurturing and enlightenment a time of meditating on what God says and contemplating on what to do about what we hear and so come we ask these things in the name that we love and that we live for and that we would gladly die for in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Alright guys, so I trust that you've thought about some questions that you can ask Brother Keith and uh, we'll do it spontaneously and uh, Brother Keith has the right to answer or maybe say oh, I don't want to put my input on that, that's up to him and, uh, and so whatever you guys feel led to ask that would benefit your walk with the Lord or something that you've been really wondering and praying about, whatever it may be um, and we'll go from there. So who wants to ask the first question? Yeah, Paul. Okay. Brother Keith, uh, <clears throat> as a man who's walked with God for so many years, uh, and a lot of us are relatively new believers, would you tell us or give us some advice on how to pray or to even teach us how to pray? Um, there's a term in the Bible, to pray in the spirit that's very controversial the passages where you get that little term from but I I don't believe that's tongues uh, many now in their millions will tell you that's speaking in another language like an angelic language I don't know what you would like to we don't want to go that way because that's not the question but I have found praying in the spirit is with your sensibilities and sometimes with grief, sometimes with joy, but it, to a great degree in my life it was as a result of this book. To the degree I was soaked in this book, I found myself praying in a way that I would never have prayed, but because of the influence, you, Paul said we have the mind of Christ. That's a staggering statement. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 says, teaches us, leads us how, what to pray. I could go into instances about miraculous leadings where you, I was about to be murdered and my kill children and my wife with these gangsters who were smashed into our home. And I was so tired, I just fell asleep, and they actually had said, kill him. They were laughing because I was, I'd spoken for a few days, and I, my family asleep. I just fell asleep on one of the children's beds with my Bible, and my suit was on. And these men broke in. They had murdered a whole family the night before, not too far away. They were, some of them had broken out of prison, and they were really on the rampage, but they were wicked men. And of course I heard bow, bow, you know, and I thought, what is that? And I woke up and I, oh my, I fell asleep. I didn't even shower or anything. What's that banging? And I realized uh, 
It must be the wind banging a door, but how, what doors open? So I got up, I walked through the house, and I just saw the, we had been broken into. They somehow got in the house, and things were all over the place. Things had been taken that we had inherited from generations, all silverware and things, and oh my. So I ran to look whether, whether the children were safe, and Jenny, was, she was over there with the one, two, well, the children were all in my bed, so, but uh, then I quickly woke them all up when I saw they were safe. We phoned the police, and uh, the policeman came, it was still dark, it was early in the morning, and he was saying things as one young policeman who, uh, what time do you think it was that they broke into your home like that? So I looked at him and I thought, oh my, how am I supposed to know what time? <laughs> you know, we've been sleeping for hours now. And as he asked the question, I the phone went. So I picked up the phone. We didn't have mobile phones those days, so it was a godly young man, very godly, uh, similar to your age, and he had heard me preaching and things, and a very dear boy. And it was early. People don't phone you at that early hour. So he said, are you all right? Keith, are you all right? Are you, are you safe? Are you? Is everything okay? So I said, yes, thank God we're safe. We're, but how did you know? Because he's the other side of a city. Uh, but... 10, 20, 30 miles away. How, how did you know? He said, know what? So I told him, you know, we broke, it's been a break, I'm sitting with the police here, and uh, he said, you know, I, I've, I don't dream, I don't, I never remember it. I woke up sobbing with such grief for you and the children. My wife, What's wrong with you? you know, so I said, I don't know. I, I didn't have a dream, but there's something that happened while I'm thinking about Keith, Daniel, and his family, that there's, they're in danger or something. And it's, it's, I got, I'm just full of fear. And he weeping. So he wanted a phone. He says, you can't phone this time of the night. People think you're crazy. Uh, so we, we got on and prayed, and he said, you know, as I got on and prayed, I just sobbed and sobbed and groaned with a grief and a fear for God to protect you, if this is anything. So I said, what time exactly did you wake up weeping like that? So he said, two o'clock in the morning. He said, it was two o'clock. I said, hang on, and I said to the policeman, it was two o'clock they broke in. <laughs> I think he must have thought, well, is this the thieves telling you a little account now? <laughs> they caught those men, and uh, they had found they had uh, murdered people the night before, and the day before that killed two other people in the other area, just the other side of the city. Uh, they weren't just intent on thieving. They, wa they slaughtered you. No regard for life, they were so hardened and evil. Anyway, there was a court case and the lawyers and all that, so I had to go there to make some statement. And uh, I looked at this man who had d done the killing. He was really a very horrible looking man. And uh, here's the court case going on. Here's the judge, here's all, and here's the the attorneys, the different defense lawyers, etc., trying to prove things and trip me up even to defend this criminal. But every time I looked at him and he looked up, he started like screaming, almost a demonic scream. Like he looked up at me and he went, Row! Go down. So even the judge, a lady judge, she, she was getting perturbed and everybody was unnerved the way this boy. This man was uh, And then it came out that with this one guy that was in the 
they said, kill him with me. Kill him. Let's kill them. They were going to kill us. He was standing over me and I was so tired I didn't hear them and they're breaking in and all that. So, um, I, sh I failed God very badly that day. I, I realized that now I could have really made a statement that would have shaken that nation, but I, uh, I, sh I should have said to him, why didn't you kill me? You were about to, you killed two other families a day before and the day before for no reason. What stopped you? Why didn't you? What made you flee from that house? And unable to look at me without howling in fear, what stopped you? I should have said that. But all I do know is, oh, oh by the way, they were all jailed for life. But every one of them was killed within days, week, weeks. Every one of them. But uh, prayer is an incredible power that we don't understand ultimately the broader picture of God's promises. But there is something about the Holy Spirit in you that you pray, you can wake up in the middle of the night groaning. And I have met people, and it's God, the Holy Spirit in you grieving at what's about to happen, but something God relies on prayer and instigates prayer and motivates to the grief that's in his heart. of, And prayer is something God, you never explain God or put him in a box, but there's something about that that God waits for. God, uh, yeah, there's incredible power. I met a woman. Uh, her son met me at the airport, and he was um, destroyed by sin. But uh, he was a little boy when he was molested sexually at his school, when he was very small. Oh, I don't know, teenager, young teenager. but molested horribly, okay? And his life was just destroyed. It was, he was a mess before. He was a lovely child. His mother was godly. And he said to me, um, I've got a godly mother, sir. And something strange happened that night that put fear in my heart. That's why I'm even coming to see you, because of the fear that flooded my heart. Then when I, when I came home from that school event, and they dropped me at my door, and the door opened, my mother looked at me and she was sobbing. I thought, what's happened? And she said, what happened to you tonight? My boy, what happened to you? And she just took me and she sobbed. I've never recovered from the sexual mo molesting that happened. The teacher, of course, was jailed when all this came out and that had done this to him and other boys. But a very, very wickedly perverted man to the degree he did things. But um, I, I met that woman. And I said what her son had said to me. She said, you know, suddenly I just started sobbing. And the grief, and it was just him in front of me. I knew something, I knew, and I was on my face crying for God's protection. And I knew something terrible was happening to my boy. I trusted him to be taken to this event that night, to the schooling, where all the kids were requested to go and... Uh, now here's another incident, and I could go on and on of people who prayed in the spirit with a grief. That is true. That is true. There's so many incidents of prayer that God makes you pray, or your mother pray, 
or people the other side of the whole city sobbing at two o'clock, grieving, crying out to God for mercy that stops. Well, why didn't God stop that boy being hurt, molested? I believe he was going to be, something was going to happen to that boy that would have been irreparable for eternity, forever. And I think the mother's prayers were God's grief. And God, that woman, it was just something that stopped it going further of which possibly could have really been, I don't want to, I don't want to think about the details, I don't like that. So there is prayer like that. There's prayer that you can go on and on and on, teach you to pray. Luther, Martin Luther said uh, when he, when the Reformation started, okay, all hell rose against him and he was, the Pope said that someone must kill this wild boar, okay, that's risen up in the kingdom. And he was hidden in a castle in Wittenberg and uh, from being slaughtered because every Roman Catholic now, he's the vicar of Christ on earth, they say, the old Pope. Uh, and he's called for the man to be, be yeah, Luther said uh, he was so s destroyed, uh, even the devil, it seems, was a physical appearance. And when you think of the millions that have been saved as a result of Luther's Reformation, he picked up the ink and threw it against the wall. The ink spot's still there to this day in that castle in Wittenberg in Germany. But all hell came against him. And he said there came a time and he couldn't pray. He was numb. He, he was wiped out. As all hell was against him, even Satan appearing, it, he wore out. It didn't that he shouted hallelujah one step at a time. He didn't. And that happens in life. And he said, you know, for some reason he was just impressed to open up the book of Psalms and uh, he just started praying wherever he opened he just praying out because his mind was like he couldn't pray he couldn't ask God a thing he, he couldn't think of what to pray and he just started praying it a lot and he said he, he couldn't believe that he was praying what he should have been praying but in a way he'd never been able before and every storm most of them start with agony at the injustices and the cruelties and the wrongs and the hurts and the wounds and the weariness of life and end putting their eyes on God and then praising God for protection and deliverance. And he just prayed. And he said he was lifted right into the presence of God in a way he had never, ever known. Just praying the Psalms. And he said from that day, most of his prayer life, was just praying the Psalms because he realized these Psalms are in the Bible. They're the set work book of God in the school of God. And the Psalms are in the prayer master, the, the, the teachers, the prayer master in the school of God is the Psalms to teach you to pray. They're not just there to tell us how David said or different situations. They're there to teach you because he said he learned for the first time to pray as he ought to pray. And many, many, many Christians I've met, they do, they pray the Psalms. A great portion of their lives, of their quiet times, their devotions, because believe it or not, Luther wasn't the only one the devil hammers and people hammer and cruelties and justices from within their own home. And people learn in their weariness to pray as they've never been able to pray before by the schoolmaster of prayer, the book of Psalms. Now you could touch prayer, you could go on and on and on and on in the incidents. Uh, prayer, how do we pray? As God leads you, sometimes with weeping, sometimes I prayed. This one morning I was on my way to lecture at some theological seminar and I normally would arrive just as I'm, you don't want to sit there with the students before because they, they'll divert you from everything you've prepared and sharpen yourself to lecture because I don't lecture, I preached to them. But uh, I was early, the other side of the city, and I just thought, let me go to this coffee shop. So there's in a very affluent area, beautiful restaurants in a mall and parking areas. So I sat there and the coffee comes and I thought, I'm not going to go there early because well, I've got half an hour or so and nearly an hour. Uh, 
I don't want to go there, the students are just waiting and when they see the car they're there and they just talk and talk and talk. And It's wonderful, but you know, the, when you preach, you'd like to go from God's prison straight to the pulpit. Anyway, I was sitting there, the guy comes along, he gives me a cup of coffee, cappuccino, cream, whatever it is, you know. And uh, biding the time, just got my notes there, funny enough, and just going over them to be sharp, because they filmed these lectures, so. I had prayed, protect me under the blood of Jesus Christ from any dangers that the devil would orchestrate to hurt me that morning before I left the house, in the vehicle or anywhere, any step. I prayed from my heart. I, I've learned to pray that as a result of things that happen, you know, that you realize you've got to ask God's protection. When you get in a car, you ask God's protection. Don't. One boy turned to me and said, "You, why do you have to always pray, even to get in a car? We can't even, if we're going to die, we're going to get killed. And, oh, it's, don't you demand God protects us. When we, that's the way we've got to go. I said, you've got to pray, man. He was upset with me anyway. He got in his car with this attitude and smashed into cars upon cars. People were, oh. So he, he learned. But... Uh, that restaurant, you know, I sat there and suddenly something said to me in my heart, no voice, just go. Go now. So I got up, I said to the waiter, he says, you want a second cup? Because they knew me <laughs> from other times. Uh, I was the only one in the restaurant, apart from the waiters. Uh, no, I just wanted a bill immediately. Something just urgently said, go. And... Uh, so I he walked out the door, got in the car, reversed, began to just turn the car, and <laughs> bombs just exploding in that restaurant. Now it was Jewish owned and I think there was Islamic things behind it. That's what they think. Where my car had been parked at the window, you know, and I was sitting just behind the glass, that's where you're sitting. I would have been blown right to smithereens. There was nothing left of the restaurant. But I stood there and I thought, God, I could have died. It happened in the Empire State Building. I, I hadn't, I had been once up, was I? I don't know, anyway, I go in there, go to the top, and it was snowing, and there's ice blocks on the top level deck. And they close, you're not allowed to go out. You can stand inside, it's all closed with the glass. And there was about 30, 40 people in there, all wanting to go in the decks, because I love architecture. My daddy, he built some of the, he, he was behind some of the great structures of the world. Oh, so not of our nation, sorry. But he, um, he put a love in my heart for art. And I used to stand there and say, oh Lord, I wish my daddy could see this in the Chrysler building and these other architectural, in their own way, unique and amazing. So I stood there and I saw all the doors closed and I thought, oh, oh. I came all this way and now I can't even go out there and look at the buildings. You know? This was after I'd preached across America, so I, that's how I thought out a bit. Anyways, suddenly, I saw a little coffee thing there and about 20, 10, 15 people standing waiting for their coffee in a little line, you know, so I stood in the line and I may as well at least have some coffee, seeing as I can't go out and look at the buildings, you know, before I go down. I'm not going to linger up inside there now. So I stand in the queue, the little line is going and uh, suddenly the exact same urgency, go now. Like, no voice, just... And I remembered that coffee shop. And I turned, and a fear filled my heart. And the elevator, the lift, I know what you call it in, in this country, it's a lift, you go up and down the building, okay? The elevator, okay. So, the doors were closing, and this guy was just saying, is there anyone else? And I... Began to run, you know, just like where the windows, you know. 
and somehow I just pow, boom, pushed myself in. When we got to the bottom, the alarms were all on, and that was the first terrorist attack was in the Empire State before they did the buildings coming down. The, the guys, there was a few dead, they threw grenades, people were blown, parts of their body were off, and they just went wild up there. So I said, what's going on? They wouldn't let you out, and all the security closed, and the people were all panicking, and everybody screaming down at the bottom floor, and the security guy, he said, there's terrorists up there, and there's, they've just started slaughtering people. So I just stood there, and I said, God, this is the second time. But you know, I pray every morning, but I prayed that morning very earnestly. Protect me as I go through this city. I'm the other side of the world, I'm alone. I want to, I love Central Park, and I'm not exactly a tourist, but I, why, you don't come to New York and not see the Empire State Building, this madness and that, you know. So there you are. But it goes on and on that God does answer prayer and initiate prayer. But to the degree you soak yourself in the Bible, I believe to that degree you have a tenderness with God. And I believe you can go on and on with prayer on every aspect of life. Prayer be, is behind. My little boys were in Buckingham Palace with the Queen. We were preaching in some parts there. I was, they were small, you know. And, uh, oh, where is Buckingham Palace? Hi. This, they had, we'd gone through Green Park and Hyde Park and there's Buckingham. And I don't know what they did. We must have walked for about an hour and a half, two hours, and going through the city, over the hills of the park. So we come and I said, where is Buckingham Palace? I said to this man, I'm so tired. And the kids were tired, dragging them walking. We didn't go by train, we, we thought we'd walk, you know. There was a, so this man says, oh, this is Buckingham Palace. And this big, horrible wall, you know. So he says, not the front, he says, this is where the garden is, where the queen has her tea parties and all that. It's beautiful, the other side of this big wall, you know. But this is Buckingham Palace. So he says, you walk down there, another 10, 15 minutes, you'll come to the front where you see the, all the changing of the guards and all the, when she comes out, you know, onto the balcony, etc. on occasion. But this is it. So my boys is, said, we, we're going to see the queen. <laughs> and that's my boys. So the man said, no, the queen won't be there. You see that flag? That flag means she's not in the palace when it's down. If she's up, then the queen's in the palace. So all those flags, you see, it just tells you the queen's not here. There's no, nothing, no event, nothing. So you, and you won't see her, uh, even if she is. You know, this is a public occasion, so we won't see but we came to see the Queen, Master. <laughs> well, you won't see her, and off he goes, you know. <laughs> so we walk in, and he Daddy, we've got to see the Queen. We can't leave London and not see the Queen. I said, I'm so sorry, but obviously we won't. At least we see where she stays, you know. We can say, we'll take some photographs of Buckingham Palace. Let's pray. Daddy, they stand still. My children are very adamant. Let's pray. We're going to ask God to let us see the Queen. I, I looked at him and I said, you pray. I'm not praying for something that you can't pray for. So they pray. This is Noel and Roy. Amen. So I just looked at them. Say amen, Daddy. <laughs> you tell us to say amen. Because we two or three of you agree. Now you've got to agree. Amen, Daddy. <sighs> amen. <laughs> so we turn, we start walking a few steps, and we hear sirens. And down come a pan. whole lot of guys on motorbikes with the Grenadier Guards on motorbikes. And then other things and other things about a hundred police on different vehicles and motorbikes that look like horses, but they look like the Grenadier. There they come. And what is it? There's a gate in the back part of the Buckingham Palace. This big cars come out, and here's this beautiful car with a windscreen the open, in there, the glass covering. And who is it? The Queen. 
And what happens? She must have made them slow down, you know, with these kids just jumping and screaming. And I had to even keep them from the road, and she must have said slow. So they slowed down, and she looked at my boys, and she waved it. And they waved, and she couldn't get over it. She's looking back, and even Prince Philip, he was in the car with her. So we're walking. And little Noel turns to me and says, uh, You see, Daddy? Pray. <laughs> and there's been times, little boys, when I, I've turned to my son and I've, my both boys and I've said to them, You know, God's not answering my prayers and we really are in a situation. I won't go into the details, but um, we've noticed when they pray that in, uh, on many occasions, God answered where we really were in crisis and critical situation that nobody in the world but God knew and the kids knew. And the most incredible answers to prayer. And I've said to them, you pray and bow. So I've resorted in all honesty to there because there's a childlike simplicity and trust that uh, God works in their hearts. That I've had to turn to my kids on numerous occasions because uh, I think I get too weary or complicated about things, you know. But prayer is what God wants, waits for, and I believe that those children, the Lord had a holy obligation to show my children that even though they're children, he honors prayer. Because that woman didn't have to come out of that gate in that second, just a few steps after those boys had prayed. That, those things are not coincidence. The one boy says, we're praying, Jenny says, we have need. Uh, when I come back, and I say, oh, so let's just pray. Uh, with accounts and all sorts of things, you know, that have to be paid. So we have to get it now, Keith. We've been away two weeks. I didn't want to burden you, but we've got to pay these things. Are they going to cut off this and that? Oh, boy. We pray. So I said to my son, you pray. Because really, I, I thought, where is this going to ever come from? <laughs> he prays, noly. Next day, he's not well. He couldn't go to schooling. So we had to go out. But we don't normally leave the children alone, but we had to in the house. So there he is alone in the house, and we get back home. He's excited. Daddy, do you remember what we prayed for? What you asked me to pray for last night? He said, well, Daddy, when you went, there was a knock at the door, and I, you, I know you said I would never open the door, but I somehow pulled it on the chain and the security and said, who are you? So he says, is this Keith Daniels home? Yes. So uh, who are you? I'm his son. Okay. Well, Lord, I know your, I don't know your daddy, but I couldn't go to work this morning, and I'm late, because the Lord has told me to come and find his house and give you this. Just tell your daddy that this is. I've got to go, you know. So she puts an envelope and so. Nolly says, "Daddy, I opened it. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> it's the exact amount of money that you told us to pray for, Daddy. It's exactly that did something to that boy's faith. That did something. I was home. I had been away for about ten days preaching. I come home, Jenny. It's a Sunday afternoon." I'm weary, the driving, all that. Then he says, oh, we have need, okay, so. I'm just giving you every aspect of prayer, okay, different, and how the Lord shook me. So she tells me we have, so I said, oh, boy, let's just pray. So I prayed, I'm going for a walk. I've sat in that vehicle so long, I'm walking. It's the cool now, so I went walking down the streets, Peter Marisburg, down. And I think about 20 minutes after I left the home, this car pulls up next to me. I thought he was going to say, look, I need directions. Do you know where the street is? That's going to help you. Is your name Keith Daniel? I said, do I know you? He said, no. I've never heard of you in my life until just a little while ago. And he said, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what you're going to think. But I believe God said to me, I've got to come to this street, which I've never been in this area before, and I would find a man walking by the name of Keith Daniel, and to give you this. 
take it. Boom, he drives off. I don't know his name, I didn't even take his number, his registration number. So I, now it was a lot of money, but it was exactly to the cent what we had prayed for about half an hour before. And uh, this sort of thing, all right, you don't have to think, well, I don't have to work, I just pray and somebody's going to walk up to me. You, know? ha, you work hard <laughs> and you pour your life out. Even if you're in God's service, I never worked so hard in my life in secular work. But there's a happiness and a joy and a pleasure in giving every fact. So, yeah. But this isn't a reason to go and think, oh, well, that means prayer will mean I don't have to work, you know. So, uh, I could go on and on in different avenues and aspects of prayer that have turned nations to God. If God could just find a man, Jonathan Edwards, up in, in uh, New England, the man was desperate in a way for the deadness of the churches and the, the irreverence and the, there was nothing of seeking God. This is wickedness and, you know, the early days and uh, he has had this burden and he suddenly started weeping but he didn't eat he, for 10 days he didn't eat he didn't sleep sorry six days he didn't eat he didn't sleep just weeping groan into god give me new england john knox had prayed that for scotland and god gave him scotland he said, give me new england Give me in New England this godly preacher praying on it, weeping and groaning, fasting, not eating, not sleeping, day and night. And as he was praying, he was writing this sermon out, which became one of the most famous sermons in history, this sinners in the hands of an angry God. And uh, he preached. I stood in the spot where the pulpit was. The building's gone now, where he preached that sermon the first time. And revival broke out. And he preached the same sermon across New England. In 100 towns turned to God. They couldn't find a soul in those towns, not one of them, that hadn't turned to God. God just began it. And it stopped. But this whole, the first major, what we term revival, was that. It's turning. One hundred towns turned to God. You see, that man was praying, fasting, and look what happened. Now they're all the Christians everywhere, all across New England, crying to God when nothing was going on, no further revival. He preached, but there was no breakout anywhere. So they were fasting and praying all over, and one old woman was praying, and she had a dream, and she saw a face. I don't believe in dreams, by the way. I don't go that way. But there is certain instances in history where it was. So. Most dreams are because you ate too much. <laughs> we had meat. And don't say that's God now in every dream. It's rubbish. It's, I've spoken to people the moment they talk about dreams. But when were you saved? And most of I've asked them, they were never saved. They're going to hell. So dreams mean nothing. But anyway, this woman had a dream. She had come to God through Jonathan Edwards. And she was godly. And she was crying to God with everybody. Let the revival go on in America. It's just in New England. So, what happened? She sees in her dream this face and the name George Whitfield. So, she's crying to God to bring George Whitfield to New England, where the revival had swept across, you know. Already it was having repercussions across the world, but who arrives? George Whitfield. He Wow, he's there. He was in England. God took hold of his heart to, to get in a boat. He was over there. And not even knowing where he's going, who he arrives at the situation where this woman was. And, of course, the great Jonathan Edwards. So, he started preaching. And uh, God just swept through America as the immigrants were coming from all over the world with all the suffering and the poverty and the hopelessness to a land of hope and so they were coming and as they streamed this George Whitfield carried on with Jonathan Edwards behind him 
And because Jonathan Edwards by that time was revered, the pulpits were open to him and uh, to this great George Whitfield. And this nation turned to God. As the immigrants poured in, they just turned to God in their thousands and thousands as he swept around. He just went across traveling. He died young because he, he was Wesley's close friend. And Wesley said, blood was pouring out. And he said, I'm going back. I've got to go back. A seventh visit uh, all over, you know. But that was, America turned to God. And it was Jonathan Edwards' prayer. There's no doubt of that. A man that God got hold of. You can't work up such grief for a nation. You can't work up such grief for a man who's about to be murdered. You can't work yourself up emotionally. You go mental the day you try and work yourself up. Don't do that. Christianity is just yielding totally and going through with God and steadfast faith with this and remembering you, you're human. But the Holy Ghost can take hold of a heart that is so right with him and use him, not only for a man about to be murdered and his family, not only for a boy being molested by a maniac, putting it mildly. God knows where it would have ended if that woman hadn't prayed like that. But for nations, when God sees the heart, those sort of prayers, yes, but generally, you pray without any emotion as you have needs, as you sense what is needed to be prayed for protection, as you sense what's needed to be prayed for people, that no one else knows what you know about that person. No, it's your report. And you pray without emotion, just solidly with the understanding, not some other language. We're in a trance. I do believe that's in the spirit, with no emotion. And you find the most incredible, staggering answers to that prayer. That if you hadn't prayed, God knows wouldn't have, what would have happened. And when you can't pray, which I tell you something has happened to me on times, you become so weary in the fight, in the battlefield, in the front line, Satan comes, he's a terrible foe, through the most unexpected sources, and you are so wiped out. And I pray the Psalms, and I tell you something, Luther was right. I learned to pray also. I would say properly, by simply praying through the Psalms aloud. That is one question. Um, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When you hear the promises of God, where two or three of you agree, touching anything that's the will of my Father in heaven, in my name, it shall be done. That's God promising you. So you get two or three when your prayers aren't being answered. And you cry together. And, then, and I tell you, there I've seen things. And then there's fasting. Oftentimes when there's such critical things that you cannot believe what terrible, terrible things you suddenly, of people, of lives, and even of your own children sometimes. And you start fasting. And the prayers that aren't being answered of the incredible crises and tragedies and sufferings and whew, you fast. And I don't know one prayer God didn't answer fully. After a few days of fasting, not eating. But I did take liquids. I don't believe you must be unwise. But then you need to read people like Rhys Howell's intercessor. Um, praying Hyde. Read those books. Ian Bounds on prayer. You've got great books with illustrations that moved the world, of how people moved the world to God when they learned to pray, when they dared to pray. They dared. Moody prayed in the pulpit in Scotland when they kicked him out of London and said, we don't want you to go back to America. And there he was taken to Scotland and he prayed, and he prayed a prayer, give me Scotland. And Scotland turned to God almost in its entirety through Moody. Yes, he did great things here in Chicago, but nothing was more great in Moody's life than Scotland. 
John Knox turned Scotland away from Rome. Moody turned Scotland to God in the masses and multitudes. There was never anything before or since in Scotland. Scotland wouldn't have been a reverential, it's, there's nothing left now, apart from like you and me. There's proportions, little groups that are godly, but Scotland is like the rest of the world that once trembled as nations before God. They're in the world, they reject. There's religion without reality. It's a social event. But Scotland turned to God and was known as a God-fearing land across the whole world through D.L. Moody. When he prayed one prayer in the pulpit, give me Scotland. And God in that meeting started. Truly the greatest revival in the history of Scotland through one man who hadn't been through a theological seminar, who hadn't got much education, but he was filled with God, the Holy Ghost, and he devoured the scriptures by that time. But that's one question. Do you dare to ask a second question? Because, yeah, yeah that's an hour. <laughs> well, uh, feel free to, you can give short answers to the questions. I'm sure there's a few more questions. We'll take a few more questions. But, uh, yeah, brother, can you feel free? Hello. You look a little off. Yeah, do you need a different chair? Or would you like to have more? I'm fine, thank you. My little leg gets a little bit, but don't worry, you can't do anything about it. I had a stroke about a year and a half ago and uh, steadily healing. Thank God it didn't affect my brains or my speech, which most people can't speak or even think properly. But it was that section of the brain that affected physically. And I do battle to sit long or stand in one spot. Uh, but it's healing. And it happened about 10 days ago when the Lord gave me a promise in the morning up in Green Lake. I am the Lord that healed thee. And I said, Lord, I don't want to be presumptuous. But I did take hope then. That day as I was walking, it started really healing. So I'm sitting here far, 99% better than I was two weeks ago, where I would have been really struggling. I said, so God has done something wonderful. And I, the doctor did say, the specialist, when I had the stroke, that he does believe, if I'm careful, I will totally heal with whatever effects it had on my soul. That's why I'm sitting. See how long that took. What question did someone have? Another question? And for the sake of time, uh, brother, you don't feel like you have to go too long. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. That's a rebuke. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Uh, what advice do you have on um, being an aid to friends who have backslidden in their faith? Being near to them. Uh, to your friends who you had friends, those friends before, and they were right with God, now they're backslidden in the world. Yeah, I, I haven't seen, I, we've moved to separate cities since then. So A friend or friends? Uh, one friend. Mm. Backslidden into real sin? Yes. Mm. You keep a distance from people. There's a, there's a tender line that you dare not cross over when you're dealing with people who've in sin, whether unsaved or saved. And you do try and reach them, and you do, but you do not stay long enough to join them again or be drawn back into it or influenced by what they're stooping to do. And trust me, something, you go near a man in sin and stick around longer than you ought to, and you drawn in. You get tempted with things that you would never want to look at or be near. Influences, depending how close the friend was. I just said to most of my friends, I don't want to ever see you again in my life. I'm not going to see you. And as you come to Christ now, I'm telling you all now about Jesus with all my heart. My heart longs for you to be with me, but I, will, I don't want to ever see you again in my life. And I wept. Because you might draw me back, and you're not going to do that. And I think even with a backslidden friend, you can pray for them. There's a book by D.O. Moody. Uh, his two great books, The Way to God and Heaven and How to Get There, those two books were his real spurs. And everybody was stunned by it because of the simplicity, but the incredible compassion that nobody seemed to have. When Moody preached, there was a compassion that broke people's hearts. And those are in those books that captures something of what we will never know about Moody if it wasn't for those two books. There's one chapter there on the backslider. Don't tell them to read that, just tell them to read the book. 
it's soft covered and it's available to this day I do believe I've given out hundreds oh, more over 50 years the way to God by D.R. Moody and the one chapter is on the backslider but it's all illustrations and scriptures uh, in his simplicity but profoundness and where I've dealt with backsliders not particularly myself but given to mothers fathers or people who put it in the hands of the backslidden one in their home or something they have just turned back to God through that book so I recommend it to you to send it to him and there is on the internet I think uh, a sermon I preached years ago called um, When the Godly Fall you see the title and that has brought multitudes of people who were hardened and in sin and were once saved when I say once saved were right with God once upon a time and they are now back with God preachers who were putting on a front but were in sin turned to God through that and, and there's another one called where, where there's a couple of sermons that deal with the backslider you try and reach people in every aspect of life when you know so there are numbers of sermons that have been used but that one I would send him and that book and just say please I'm begging you listen to the sermon listen to it first yourself when the godly fall I just Google whatever that means in my name I don't know how to type I don't even know how to type what like you doing I've never sent an SMS in my life I do not know how and I've never sent an email in my life I don't know how and I don't want to <laughs> there you are you know why you get busy with those things you get no time left with it trust me if you're too much taken up with everything of these these um, technical things today you can be drowned as an addict I know these preachers uh, before the next things on the horizon you know, before you've, you've got a brand new thing to keep up to date with what internet and these things, you know, there's something coming that's better. And you've got to have it. And you, in the end, your whole life is drowning, trying to keep up with. You don't need them, man. Who wants to hear that you're having a bath? I am now about to have a bath. I mean, there's mental instability going on in the world through those things. And it's created a generation that, of people that can't do a thing without, and they get depressed. I read an article the other day that psychologists and psychiatrists across the world, they're dealing with one massive, massive problem, suicidal people, if they don't get enough people listening to the fact that they're brushing their teeth now. There's something mental going on through those things. And everybody's sharing things you don't need to share that you're gonna get into trouble. That thing, Brother, throw it away. <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> Listen, good brother. Of course, these technical things are wonderful. And of course, we're living in a privileged age. And of course, the internet is an incredible privilege, an age of knowledge at your fingertips. Of course it is. But guard yourself that you don't drown as an addict. Keeping up with everything that thing's going to give you. Boy, the devil can keep you busy with things that are wonderful and legitimate and really good. Just to keep you from this. I don't want to have a quiet time like I'm driving an airplane, you know. I just want a Bible. Hmm. And you want to see how some preachers get sermons. This guy says to me in Canada. Oh, I don't worry about working on a sermon. I got to preach and I just press on the internet. Subject, everything, full sermon. Why do I want to waste my time getting some uh, dangers, shortcuts to death? Hmm. I looked at him and I said, You are in trouble. For a preacher to say that he doesn't get messages from God's heart as a result of seeking God, devouring the word, and walking with God and learning, just pressing a button, you're in trouble. The next thing I heard, he had done some terrible, and he was kicked out of the ministry. Yeah, be careful. Don't let that take the place of quiet times. Don't let it take the place as a preacher of, hmm, of working through the nights, weeping and getting revelation. Next and last question. Hmm, you've got to be careful who asks then. 
unless Daniel forces another one, because he's the boss here tonight, you see. Okay, you. So, hearing about, like you were talking about revivals and all the mighty men used by God and all the godly people used throughout history of seeking God fasting and seeing God move. Um, when I hear about all of these great testimonies and then look about my life, I wonder if there's something wrong. Like, um, No. Um, one man I met, a great soul winner, he's old now, but he's, when he was young, and I was young, and I'm younger than him, but he would testify that he's seeking God for a, a, a total surrender. This is a terminology that each preacher, Hudson Taylor, Dio Moody, everyone has some terminology of a crucified life, absolute surrender. Spurgeon, Moody, everyone. Billy Graham, he just talks of the fullness of the Spirit. The, uh, Pentecostals and other people in the old days, like Torrey, used the word the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which nobody uses these days because it's been abused totally out of its context by most of the emotional churches. But um, this guy would stand up and say, I've trusted God for total surrender and to be filled with God, the Holy Spirit. I desperately needed this total surrender. It goes to this godly old man, that he's the godliest man I ever met in my life, Will McFarlane, um, who was there at that, and he said, uh, Mr. Mac, I, I, it doesn't work. So Mr. Mac said, but you testified in that big meeting that you've totally, that was a few days ago, what went wrong? What makes you think you're not filled with the Spirit or totally surrendered? He said, because I look at your life, Mr. Mac, and I realize I can't be filled with the Spirit. I look at you and I, Mr. Mac says, man, I have been saved for, I don't know, what, how many years? Uh, I have been totally surrendered, and whatever terminology they use, filled with the Spirit, a Spirit-filled life for so many. You're a baby in in Christ, you're a babe in this total surrender. You can't compare your life. You can't expect perfection. God doesn't promise that. You've got to work on, but you are totally surrendered. But you're just a babe. Wait for 50 years. But don't doubt, simply because you look at somebody that's 50 years ahead of you. You're never going to do that. It takes time. The refinement of God. When it comes to praying in such a way, I believe certain people are staggeringly. My little boys prayed for the Queen, but I doubt that they would have the courage or the faith to pray for a nation. Others, God takes hold of in their circumstance and what He's burdened them for. He creates circum, He orchestrates in your life to pray for things that others will never pray for and to pray with faith and desperation. You just got to, you know, the one thing you've got to do. You have one duty. Get up in the morning and make sure you meet with God. And as much as you can, that is possible to the degree you soak yourself in the Bible and meditate and pray as a result. You do that. If God has greater things in mind, it will happen, trust me. You're just not going to rush God and go ahead of Him now. Or try and be something. Or work up grief. Or work up fasting for six days, weeping, not, you, you can't do that. Praying Hyde said, he recommends you don't have this 30 days of not eating, 40 days all the time, oh, in the next 40 days. And wars turned as he was praying. That battle, that was the crisis battle, you read that book, you, they were praying, and the Normandy battle turned the whole history of the world when Hitler was just, but they were fasting for 40 days. But then he said, don't, I don't recommend anyone does this because I did no labor. I had nothing else to do on my agenda. I was alone and I fasted. And there was a unique. Don't try and emulate people prematurely also. We all get influenced by the great men. We all do. 
it is something of an influence that you don't because you subconsciously want to emulate and find yourself. But uh, you can't jump the gun and you certainly can't stand in the shoes of these great men. Perhaps one day, and perhaps if that's where God really wants you to really shake the powers of hell through the world when he sees your growth and your heart and your dedication and the simplicity of walking with God in the things that matter. This is all that matters. You do that and leave the rest to God. And you'll find something. You will start praying more and more effectively as you soak yourself in the Bible and get up and go on no matter what the devil does against you and never give up and grow and you will grow in faith you will grow in understanding you'll grow in the, having the man of mind of christ there's no point that you don't stop growing i do believe on your deathbed the little finest final things that are needed are happening until you die there's more to do and you're a babe in christ don't get despairing now and don't jump the gun and start doing things that i was fasting and this one woman walked into this little chapel on a very big conference center, so she sees me, I'm on his missionary from America, lovely woman. And she says, I'm not disturbing you. And, uh, okay, she says, you don't come and eat with all the convention. People are, where's this young guy who's preaching? Why aren't you eating? Why are you here? Everybody else is eating. She says, no, I've been fasting, and I didn't want anyone to know. She says, how long have you been fasting? So I she said, you be careful, boy. And that's how she spoke to me. She was an older woman. I fasted also, and my kidneys collapsed. And I was off the mission field for so long, just crippled because of fasting. She said, you be careful. Even how you fast one day, when you want God to do through you what he did through Jonathan Edwards, six days, six nights, no sleeping, no eating, just crying night and day to God until that Sunday where God came and started what became the greatest revival in the history of the world, what started with Jonathan Edwards through those six days of crying, fasting, weeping, sinners in the hands of an angry people just start falling down, weeping all over, holding onto the pillars, screaming for God to keep them out of hell, to save them. They were, it was so, yeah, well, you see, uh, that was the, the spark that lit, that was the flame that lit the fire. This is a quotation from church history that swept across America for 120 years, just back and forth. Whitfield, right down, Charles Finney, 1,500 cities. Not 100 cities, in 1,500 cities in 20 years. Across America turned to God, most of them in their entirety. And the critics of people like Charles Finney say, yeah, but they didn't survive. Where did that story came from? I don't know. <laughs> so they asked me about that. What happens about the, the fruit of the great Finney, you know? Not everybody went there. I said, where do you get that from? Yeah. Little critic. So I said, listen, you read Hitch history. When Finney got too sick to preach, the the beginning of the greatest movement of those revivals happened, the prayer revival, with your civil war, your, your uh, one man, a Dutch Reformed Domini, a minister there in New York, I've been standing in the spot where those two buildings came down, there's an old church there, a Dutch Reformed church, and this old man was asked to take over a dead church because everybody's moving to the suburbs, and the church was dying, so... Jeremiah C. Lanfear, pow, never forget that name, okay? Get his books, or oh, the books about his life. So, what does he do? He's crying to God for a revival in New York, and here he's in the heart of Manhattan. Um, so, he decides the preaching and the handful of people left, they're not bringing people, everybody's gone, churches are going on the suburbs, but he's been asked to take over as a last resort, resort to keep his old church up. He goes around holding pamphlets out. There's a prayer meeting for revival in America because St. Finney's revivals had come to an end. He had been saved under Charles Finney. 
And he, uh, now, there was this no moving of God across America anymore. Finney was too sick to preach. And uh, so, Jeremiah C. Lanphier started going around all the office blocks of Manhattan, come to a prayer meeting in lunchtime. Six arrived. Pow, there they are, including him. They cry for an hour, just under an hour, for God to send a Every Tuesday, I believe, they met in this little Dutch Reformed church, still standing there. It was hurt by the big buildings coming down, but they So, next week, 24. Pow, next week, 48. Next week, 10,000. There was no room in the church. What happened? While they were crying to God, the financial collapse of the whole of America happened. Wow, the banks closed their doors. People who thought that money couldn't even get a money. People were committing suicide. It was a death. It was shock across the whole of America. This financial collapse, it's a terrible thing to happen. You don't know what to do because you can't get your money even. And your money's worth nothing if you can. And this prayer meeting was known. 10,000 came and crying to God. In the end, you can't believe the amount of people praying across New York every single day for an hour, crying to God. 200,000 people in uh, New Hampshire, New Hampshire, were crying to God across that section of America, daily crying to God. 200,000. There's no building, no... They were crying. Over 50,000 people were coming to God daily. And the Civil War broke out. A third of the Confederate Army turned to Christ, were born again, including their generals, etc. And uh, there was so many hundreds of thousands. Those days, that's an incredible percentage of your population. Okay. But you think about it, for 120 years from that man's crying, fasting, the waves just went across America, hundreds of thousands. The great George Whitfield turned America to God, but then they just kept swarming from across the world. For 100 years, this country just developed in privilege and right through to Finney and then the Moody. That was the beginning of evangelism. It wasn't revival, it was organized meetings. Moody had revival in Scotland, definitely. But it all started, you see, through that 120 years. of no, no country in the entire world had what America had. And that's the only reason this country became the greatest nation on earth in every single aspect, militarily and financially, was the forefathers, the sweeping of God for 120 years of revivals upon revival, turning America to God. And of course, you're losing everything now because you haven't had a revival for a long time. Do you want to have another question, or should we end there? Does anybody have one burning question that they really want to ask, and this will be the last one? That's a disciplined group. Okay, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you it's really? Very, very short. Sure. <laughs> we'll end it with this. Okay. Very short, sure. very short sure. answer. The importance of memorizing scripture and tips on how to do it. You, we know, we recognize God's gift on your life to be able to do that, but for somebody that might say, I have difficulty doing it, what would you say to motivate with the motivation to do so, and maybe some tips on how to do it? Okay, I'm gonna have to take more than a minute, brother, but I won't go on and on. I'm just gonna try and brief it as I can. It makes sense, okay? Um, I do not believe a person should come under bondage to somebody that God really did mercifully in Jew. I don't like the word gifts because it's been abused and it's like instantaneous. There's neglect not the gift that is in thee. You have to study to say you have approved, Timothy. There is an obvious anointing on your life and ministry, but there is a devouring there is the discipline of that gift being developed. Yeah, so I suppose the word gifts, you'll find the word is in italics in the King James and in 
the new versions, they, they don't bring the italics, which means you're not told that isn't the word. It's endowment. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, where the gifts are spoken, endued. For the edification of the church, there's something of endowment which actually comes close to an anointing, the same word. And yeah, I do believe some people, God mercifully does give you something that you haven't got, and you will lose everything if you touch the glory just once. Just once I've seen people buried forever touching the glory when God used them or gave them an ability to preach an anointing that was above measure where people began to really realize God is with this man. So yes, I had mercifully been given an ability. I have no idea. I do know one thing though. I stuck to the King James. Now, people don't like to hear that because you know it's not. there's lots of controversy about the new versions, trust me. And uh, I don't want to go that way, but I did have one mercy shown to me. The old man that led me to Christ put the King James in mind. There was the Revised Standard Version and uh, the, the uh, Good News for Modern Man. Those sort of new things were on the horizon, okay? And uh, he just stick to this, stick to this. So I did. Now those days there was an advantage in the pulpits, Right down for 400 years, the King James, generally across the world, the English-speaking world. Spurgeon had no difficulty in it and didn't think anybody should. And he spoke like you and I. They weren't using the words these and those even when the thing was translated. That was about 150 years before. But because the king said it has to be a reverential language, the Wycliffe successor did this. Nonetheless, Every sermon I heard, only the King James. Every Bible study, only the King James. My quiet times, the books, there was nobody referring to these new, apart from liberal people who dared to try and bury the King James in the early days. They were just scoffed at apart from wild emotionalism. But uh, it was just the King James all the time. And I devoured this. And I understood it. And the more I read it, the more I realized how from God it is. This graphic, poetic language was burning in my heart. I didn't know God wanted me to memorize, but when I found I had to, when God really impressed upon me, I knew so much. It was written by God because of the repetitiveness from everywhere of the major sections that you would find being preached or used and embraced by truly conservative evangelical fundamentals. That means what we are. And uh, when I was... Memorizing, I could quote sections, word perfect, because it was there. And I didn't know I was going to memorize. God was busy doing that. And I'm 71 now. And someone said to me, uh, when you get to a certain age, you lose, lose a million cells a day, or what do they call those things? And you think, well, what's left of me? Don't escape, you know. <laughs> They really can be silly, okay? Because there's so many. They don't tell you there's zillions of these things. So anyway, um, I'm 71. I can memorize more now, in a shorter time than when I was first memorizing as a young man. And I'll tell you why. Because I stuck to one version. You see, I'm memorizing not simply because some miraculous things happening. But that was so. I know that, I acknowledge that, because I was really a dud at school. I had no academic. We don't want to go there. I, th I thought school was there for games and fun and sport. That was my whole life. I didn't know I was there to study. And I did fail badly. We don't want to go in the embarrassment of what I did, but this was God, trust me, but that I stuck to one version. Now you, we found out when all these versions, all the kids could have the living Bible. First it was the living New Testament, then the living Old Testament, then the living Bible. That's swept, then amplified, yeah. Then, which by the way is very honest, it's King James and italics is, the Greek has five words for what the English has won. So they give you the five words that had to be made a choice of contextually, the great Wycliffe, etc. They prayerfully, and I believe that's where the Texas Receptus, the King James, and your old Arabic Bible, not the new one. 
not the New English versions, okay? They're a different text altogether. Up to 70% of every verse in the Bible of the divinity of Christ, that he is God, has been omitted. Nearly 80%. Do you know 90% of every verse of judgment, eternal suffering, I won't name the version, because you might have it, is not there. There's no judgment. It's been omitted through these new versions. There is a version now coming out by the the biggest Bible societies on earth that publish the truth, that there's not one verse in the entire Bible that relates to God, that Jesus was God, that he was divine. It just brought to human. There's dangers in these new versions, okay? But oh, we get back to the old King James, yeah. It was good enough for 400 years with the greatest revivals in the history of the world, not one person, not even Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, unless you want to throw him into and say he was silly Billy saying he could understand, nobody could understand the King James. The same language you and I are speaking, they did. And they could quote scriptures today. You go into Sunday schools across the world, small and great, and they're trying to memorize scriptures. They, the one quotes from this, the other from that. By the time they get to the fourth person, they don't even know what they're going to say. <laughs> no one can memorize today. We memorized, and we didn't even know we were. So one of the great tragedies of all these new versions that people do find interesting explanations or revelations through just comparing little things, you know, um, there's, there's no doubt. It's like a little commentary in a way where you've got some really good passages in NIV and ESV, etc. Um, but the great tragedy is, the greatest to my knowledge, people can't quote a thing. We used to stand with Jehovah Witnesses and they didn't say, what version have you got? You know, We just quoted, nobody said, that's wrong. They say, today, give me the NIV and I'll argue with you. Careful. So, those days we would just quote, now let me shock you, I quote the King James only, and the smallest child doesn't breathe, I've watched them, and so do their parents. They listen and they're gripped by the King James, they understand, if it's anointed, and let me tell you how much this book's anointed, to the degree you want God's best, and have an honest heart, and you devour it, and the more you devour it, the more you realize why God honored this in the greatest revivals during the greatest revival history parts of the of the church's history. This book more than anything. And let me shock you again. These new versions, NIV overtook the sales of this King James. No one will ever catch up to the King James. There's, it's, there is no way they can even get a rough estimate, but a, even a rough, there's no version. Multiply it by 100,000, they wouldn't get near how many, including because there's a world population, including how many are, nothing will ever come compare with how many have been produced of the King James. You see, it's the most, world's greatest read Bible and book, there's nothing. The Bible's the most read book and printed book in history, but the King James, there is nothing. No new Bible, NIV, name it. And yes, over a year, two year period, NIV took over this, the, the, the annual sales for two years, not for 400 years. But let me tell you the shock. There's a swinging back to the King James across the whole English-speaking world. That the, the, They just can't attribute it. People are just putting down the new versions in their masses and going back to this book. And I have sat with countries, cultures, that they have their own Bible. Oh, we read the King James. Oh. Everywhere you go. It's become the greatest selling now again of the new versions. Or they just push aside. They're there, you go into book rooms, boom, 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 about a hundred Bibles. This version is right. The first one is always King James. And go and ask them. Ninety something percent would say, Oh no, that's the biggest selling of them all. That's why it's first. Mm. So that's because of memorizing. Memorizing. You asked another question on praying for revival, okay? You asked the question about how to mirror. Yeah? Well, there you are. I, one night, in a, and I'm going to be very, I was sitting, we had to put up tents because of this convention. Our people from over the hills and in the countryside, and each young missionary, and the Lord had been impressing on me to memorize. 
And I remember it was late, all the missionary guys and little candles there, and having their quiet times late in the night. And I remember reading Matthew 22. And again, the Lord impressed on my heart, I want you to memorize this passages and and I want you to bring that back to the pulpits. Just the word of God. So but Lord, I can't memorize like that. I can memorize certain verses and quote them on the open airs, etc. But I said, let me try, because this was deeply in my heart. I, I was trembling actually. I was thinking, where is this coming from? I can't I'm not academic. So I took that Matthew 22 because it was burning my heart and I thought, let me, and I tried. Within about half an hour I learned the whole passage, the whole chapter. So I said, but Lord, that's impossible. I'm tired, how can I? And I went, I knew, I said, God, I've got to sleep. When I wake up, if it's, this is the, let me wake up that I don't have to start again. And I knew it. So that day, then I was, I didn't want to speak to the guys we were working. So I took up Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I went on. And this guy walks up to me, this old man says, oh, I want you to preach. You are, you are in the program. Now they do not do that to young preachers. They had overseas preachers in this conference and people were coming in there from all over Africa. So I said, but I was stunned, you know. So he says, I'm giving you 40 minutes. He says, listen, young man, if you go 40 minutes and one second, I will go up into the pulpit and throw you off. You're young, you don't take advantage of me. I'm giving you 40 minutes. These other preachers have the main meetings, you're having the afternoon meeting. 40 minutes, or you're finished. Don't fail me. So I went out in the fields and I said, Lord, and the Lord put in my heart, you've just memorized Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon of the Mount. Preach it. So I timed myself, 40 minutes. And I put there. All I'm going to do is quote, people will say, well, I could have read that at home. No time for exposition. God, trust me in my heart, just trust me. And I did. I fasted for a few, until the convention started. People, I didn't eat. I went in the fields. I sharpened myself. I went aloud. And I said, Lord, let me preach it like Jesus preached it. That people forget about a man and just think, just, just be aware. This is how the emphasis where he said it with brokenness. Where, but please don't let it just be parrot fashion. Bring an anointing. And I cried to God, not and I stood up there, preached, and God just swept in that convention in a way that I can't tell you now because you won't believe what happened. While I was preaching, I had to take my eyes, not focus on what was happening out there. People just smitten on their faces. God came, and then the Lord, in a wonderful way, impressed in my heart, that's all I want of you. And that's all I did, 90-something percent of every sermon I've preached for over 50 years now, for 50 years, 51 years, was just the books of the Bible of God. Now that was dedication, that was separation, that wasn't just boom, give me half an hour, no, no. That was a life consumed and separating myself from the sports that other preachers says you've got to be human and watch some rugby match. It separated me from light-hearted talking, non-essential fellowship. I didn't neglect my family, but they know I give God when that door shut. It's, and through the nights, when others are watching little things on the flights across the world, I'm just going over the bat. It's a life, it's a dedication, it's, it's a joy. If you dare to use the word sacrifice, there's something wrong with you. It's a privilege that you separate yourself under the gospel. But I tell you what, you've got to be focused on what God wants of you and give yourself to it unreservedly, as others would never believe a human could. And I did that for the memorizing of the scriptures. Outside of preaching, it's a different thing. To the degree you memorize the vital verses, you will be used by God when you're witnessing to souls, when you have an opportunity to say something, to the degree you know, and you quote, this is the authority, this is the authority. A testimony is wonderful, but this is just gives the stamp, this is what I'm now saying, this is what God says. Take this away, you've got very little authority, emotional upheaval, you know, affection, but not authority. This is the greatest authority. This is sharper than any two-edged sword. He honors his word above all things that he said. 
we should do as preachers. Now, not every preacher can memorize passages, and I don't want them to because they'll cripple themselves because this was a unique ministry for my life that I had to acknowledge and stay very low. By the way, you don't have to ask God to keep you low. He keeps you low. You don't want to ask for more. He knows how to keep you from touching the glory if he knows your heart. But if you're foolish enough to let the sinful nature embrace pride and take the glory, God will put in my heart years ago, I'll take every single thing in one moment from you, and I know he will. One other thing before you move. What, I didn't memorize the whole Bible. What burns from the pages of this book into your heart will burn from your lips. And what burns from your lips will burn into the hearts. It's not Jews, Orthodox Jews can, in their thousands, can quote word perfect the entire Old Testament, but there's nothing of life in it. And to the degree these things burn in your hearts from the pages that God wants you to use. Don't lose them, mark them. That's what the Lord impressed on me. What burns into your heart will burn from your lips. And only what burns from yeah. So I do that. And there's one way to have anointing in quoting the scriptures, whether it's an individual or a preacher. There's not two ways. It's memorizing your but to the degree you soak your life in prayer, to the degree you soak your message in prayer before you pray, to that degree you are anointed, outside of which it's just the flesh and a charismatic personality but no anointing. Which most preachers have to rely on, a charismatic personality in the flesh. But this man just hasn't got that personality, trust me, and he has, hasn't got anything that is really able to really have any academic achievements on just so nothing. You have to attribute it to God, full stop, and it's the only anointing that is possible outside of which all you have as a preacher is a charismatic personality and the flesh. And I wonder what percentage of evangelical preachers in the world only have that. They have no anointing because they don't spend much time with God for anointing. Your life is consumed if you're a preacher in preparation. And a great part of that preparation is your walk with God. And your walk with God relies totally on prayer and letting God meet with you, not just for, not just for theology. Yeah, what impresses, God impresses in the heart you memorize. As individuals who don't preach, what you know, I'm going to need this. Mark it, those verses on judgment, those verses, just that you can answer everybody. You study, you won't hate a Jehovah Witness for stopping you, you'll stop him and make him run screaming within minutes. That's when you really don't lose and then memorize. To the degree you've memorized, to the degree you've that God will use you. And bring people along your way and then say, oh, this that you've memorized, because you memorized, I brought this, give it to them. Prayerfully, humbly, and lovingly. Let your harshest word throb with God's love, or don't speak from the pulpit especially, or you sin.